The Lord showed me the enemy is no longer interested in merely coming through the gates. He wants to burn them down completely. Now, in ancient times, this was literal, but now the Lord is speaking symbolically, figuratively. The enemy is targeting gates at all levels of society. It's not just borders, it's the seven mountains. And this is not a new strategy, clearly, but it is escalated because the Lord showed me the enemy is no longer interested in merely coming through the gates. He wants to burn them down completely. Now, here's the strategy. Watchmen must partner with gatekeepers at a higher level. We've seen for many years the watchmen on the wall, the gatekeepers guarding access. We need a new level of cooperation, sharing of prophetic intelligence, praying together between the watchmen intercessors, the watchmen prophets, and the gatekeeper intercessors. And it's the combination of the watchkeeper and the, the watchmen and the gatekeepers through the avenue of worship and prayer that's going to prevent the enemy from burning down these gates. He's not going to prevail. I decree it in the name of Jesus. I declare that the watchmen and the gatekeepers are going to rise up. They're going to share intelligence. They're going to pray without ceasing. We're going to walk in humility. And I say in the name of Jesus, the mountains will move, the gates will be secured, and we shall prevail because we are a victorious church in Jesus' name. God, I pray right now, Holy Ghost, that you shoot us out of this thing. You shoot us out of this season that seems like it's not moving. That seems like it's not going anywhere. That seems like it's stagnant in the name of Jesus. I pray right now that 2024 will be a year of movement in the name of Jesus. A year of acceleration in the name of Jesus. That the saints of God would see promises manifest in the name of Jesus. I pray right now that your time has come saw a vision of a Christmas cookie and there were molds like Christmas cookie molds you know like the trees and the Santa Claus or whatever and one of them was like a Christmas horse pulling a sleigh and one was like a candy cane and I saw a mold of, of a piece of holly you know leaf and stuff and I heard the Lord say I'm molding something new this year talking about and I knew he was talking about 2024 but then he said starting early in the year and stretching to about midway so now this is the first half of 2024 and then he said an unnerving chapter of events beginning with a bridge being built between parties okay so now he's talking about I believe Democratic and Republican parties here in the United States. And then he said, functioning as a tool, a community vision from one side meant to disrupt progress they've made toward leaving a good impact. So now he's saying there's this bridge that's being built, but one side is going to disrupt this progress. And there's a vision being stemmed there and, and, and growing there in order to do this. And then I heard this phrase, and I don't know who he's talking about, but he said, she's taking over a vengeance, a part played out uncontrollable rage meant to take apart a community and i knew when it says a community here he meant believers involved in politics and this this uh, uncontrollable rage is meant to take this community apart then i heard this is a pushing back against the recent events in parliament it's too much for them to handle so he's saying some of the positives that have happened recently some of the god fearing people that have made statements and done things he's saying and even prayed publicly things like that he's saying it's too much for those who are opposed to that to handle and then i got this impression that idaho uh that just the state of idaho may be mixed in the middle of this socially somehow um or maybe a representative from there or something like that that they would have something to do with that but then i heard she's attempting to disrupt the original mode i outlined for this nation the original structure freedom of religion is included in this one and then i heard cookies are sweet so he's going back to this mold this cookie mold thing right he said cookies are sweet they will pass this off as something delicious and tempting but it will be a perversion of the original mold i created for humankind and then the lord showed me that a sign was going to be happening around christmas time of this year and then i, I got this impression uh, that this had something to do with the speaker of the house potentially and this impression that it had to do with, with uh, vandalism of some sort and even a character attack so that's what i heard y'all um i would encourage you with words of knowledge like this take them to the lord in prayer you know but also we're gonna have to wait till after the fact to see what happens you know uh maybe what doesn't happen the way that we thought it was gonna happen uh, but also just like what happens in general and what the lord is saying through that because oftentimes once a word is fulfilled you know a word of knowledge once we see it take place the lord will often speak into that with another prophetic message uh, that has to do with it so i hope and pray that this word today has been encouraging to you man I, I was feeling the fire of god so strong as i was sharing this it was so encouraging to me hi there and welcome to the love six scribe podcast where we talk about biblical truths current topics and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word jesus christ i am don hill and i am the love six scribe Well, Happy New Year to you as you're listening to this episode of the Love Subscribe podcast. I'm so glad that you're here today. And today we are going to be talking about prophetic words for 2024. 
And I wanted to talk about this because I talked about this last year for 2023, and this may be something, Lord willing, that I do at the beginning of every year. And I talk about it because I came out of this type of movement and being um, affiliated with the prophetic and uh, knowing that there are a plethora of words that have come out. I mean, if you even take time to go on YouTube, for example, even on Google, you're going to see an, an array of messages and words that people are claiming that they're hearing from God. Uh, even just scrolling down through here, uh, there's ones that pop up. Uh, Kent Christmas, prophetic word, most important prophecy, 2024 to 2025. Prophecy shocking. Prophetic word for 2024, sowing to the heavens, Larry Sparks. Mike Signorelli, your word for the new year in 2024. Jeremiah Johnson has a 2024 prophetic word, the valley of decision. We have Chris Reed that has taken over Rick Joyner's ministry, Morning Star in South Carolina. He has a 2024 and beyond prophecies at the Vision Conference conference for 2023. Catherine Crick uh, allegedly gave um, a prophetic word for 2024 at 5F, and I listened to a little bit of it, and it sounded like the same things that she's been saying for a bit about restoring the apostles and prophets and that we need to get back all the things that have been lost. Uh, The anointing, the God's anointing that's been lost, and I, I talked about this recently on a different episode. We won't get into that. Prophetic word, what God has planned for the new year, 2024, by Daniel Adams. Patricia King, we're actually going to be looking at some of her uh, today, not all of them. She did a two-part video series on the prophetic words, and the first part contained six different prophetic words for 2024. I don't know how many part two did, but we'll look at a little bit of that and talk about it. Uh, it, it goes on through here, if you look through, the signs, the year of signs, miracles, and wonders, Troy Brewer. And then there's people that you probably never heard of on down through here as you go. Like I said, it just goes on and on. And as we just listened to some of the clips I played for you, just to give you a little sampling, the first one you heard was Jennifer LeClaire. Some people may be familiar with her, um, but she uh, was giving a prophetic word that Charisma News shared on December 31st of 2023, and it was titled, How to Prepare for What is Coming, Spiritual Insights for 2024. And in the description of this video, it said in this powerful prophetic message, Jennifer LeClaire unveils crucial insights for 2024, exposing the enemy's strategic intent to not only breach, but burn down the gates across societal realms. Drawing inspiration from the book of Nehemiah, she decodes the symbolic significance of these attacks on authority and justice. And uh, going on, as you heard, she talked about the watchmen and the gatekeepers. And uh, forgive my my, uh, sense of humor, but I'm a Gen X, if we're going to go by those different categories. I was uh, an, uh, grew up in the 80s, and so I couldn't help but immediately think of Ghostbusters, where the gatekeeper and the key master. I am the key master. I am the gatekeeper. I'm sorry. That's just where my, my mind goes sometimes to, to corny 80s references. At any rate, and then going to the next one was Kay Nash. Uh, For those that are familiar with her, she was giving the prophetic word for 2024 of the bow, and she talks about the almond tree, about it flourishing, and then you heard a little bit from Troy Black. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit, just a little bit briefly about his on here. There's three people I'll talk about that you may be familiar with, and then we're going to dive into some articles that I found online that I think will be helpful when considering prophecy, because I know this is a hot thing to consider. There's lots of people that listen to prophetic words, and they're latching on to them, and they're they're hearing these people say, God told them, God spoke to them. My contention would be that there's not a lot of evaluation of these. There's not a lot of testing, and frankly, some of these words are so vague and generalized that it makes it very difficult to test them against Scripture. If, if people say, well, just take them to the Word of God, or you'll hear Troy uh, Black say, well, just take them to prayer. And it's as if you get to hear the voice of God for yourself. As we'll talk about in a little bit, he does sprinkle in some truth of Scripture and talking about those things. There is this undertone that he is hearing from the Lord, and he'll tell you to test it, but then when you do test it, 
the high likelihood of you being called a Pharisee or a critic or religious spirit, not necessarily by him, though he may do that in a more gracious way and, or in a nicer way without name calling. But other people, if I've noticed, if you call out Troy Black and, and others that they hold up in high esteem, that is not welcomed. So <laughs> people will say, well, you can test these words, but they don't really want them tested in, in accordance with Scripture. And I'll give some arguments for this as I have before, um, but I'm I'm familiar, and, and I know many of you probably listening are familiar with the prophetic movement and, and how that operates and the things that are said and the things that are taught about fallible prophecy today within the church. But Troy Black gives this prophecy in the beginning of it, and he did share it on Charisma. I found two videos that he uh, said the same things both on his channel and on Charisma of this word. And the title of it on his channel was What God Told Me About 2024, Troy Black Prophecy. And in it, when you listen to it, again, there's some vagaries in there. It sounds like a word of encouragement. And then he goes on into this cookie cutter, uh, no pun intended, but cookie cutter, because he, he says that. He's, he's talking about a mold, but it's he's showing pictures of a cookie cutter in, on his video. And uh, um, the Christmas cookies and talking about Christmas cookies being sweet and that he's giving this this word again, when you listen to it, as we just did, it's very vague and generalized. I mean, it could apply to anything. And and um, I, I want to go back to Scripture at the end. We'll spend a good amount of time looking at some articles that will help us, guide us back to Scripture, and to help us to ask some inc- important questions, I believe, that are very relevant and necessary to ask when someone is claiming to hear the voice of God for themselves. Just to give you a little bit more taste of some of the things you'll find online, Chuck Pierce was one of the first ones I came across. He's a very well-known one that professes to be a prophet. He runs alongside Dutch Sheets, who um, professes to be an apostle. And so there's concerns that when they minister, and I've been in uh, at one service in particular in our area when Dutch Sheets came to minister, but there's a lot of political focus when they're ministering. Uh, they're wanting to to see America saved, and they're they're coming at it from that angle. So some people may even identify them as Christian nationalists. But at any rate, we'll get a little bit past that. But when you do listen to Chuck Pierce when he's traveling, he's ministering and saying these are prophetic words for the church. And there was one I came across that Destiny Image shared recently, a prophetic word for the church in 2024. And I want you just to listen to, it was a very short clip, but just listen to some of the things that he says. And what you might notice, and I I, want to try to be respectful but at the same time, I, I just be I'll be frank. When I listen to Chuck Pierce, I find myself very confused. I find myself not listening to coherent sentences and thoughts, and it sounds pseudo profound. And maybe I'm not hearing things correctly, but just have a listen for yourself. God is moving, and the voice of heaven is being released on lines around the earth. See, that's what Psalms 19 says. All of a sudden, I was enough in a spirit realm that the line about Scranton might not could have been heard here, but it could have been heard in my prayer room where I was. And then the voice of that has to get to you to say, move it forward. Now, that's what our war is over. Go ahead, Aaron, and let's look at this. Now, so Scranton, Pennsylvania becomes the place of revival, the crossroads of revelation, uh, revolution. It becomes some key factor in the way America goes for its future. And without you gathering here, without pioneering and being a part and pressing through the remnant coming together to come together in a gathering here, we could not see America advance or have faith for it to advance, to advance the way the Lord intends us to have as we go into this war ahead. The war will inten- intensify by October. Now, with that, You have to know you have a portion. That's what inheritance means. And with that portion, you have to learn to encircle your portion. And you have to learn to establish your portion. There's ladies here from Florida. They have to go back to from New York. Their roots were in New York. So they came to this meeting. They live now in Florida. They're going to take the anointing from this meeting back to Florida. See? You will take the anointing from this meeting back to Massachusetts. Back to Texas. I had to come here to get the anointing you have to bring back for me to propel myself with him into the future. 
See, I couldn't do that without pressing through to get here with you. And so every time God speaks, something's being uncovered. See, something's being ripped off of your life personally, of the territory you're living in, of the people group you're a part of. I don't think I could have come into the fullness of my call without first being called back to the first people that my grandmother and great-grandmother were part of. And every time I could hear God about it, a layer would come off my bloodline. See, that's how it works for you. Every time you hear God, something's coming out of your blood that's causing the Spirit to gain more access to you. Now, those were two separate clips from that short eight-minute clip that was provided by Destiny Image. The last clip you heard about the bloodline, that was about six minutes, 37 seconds into that clip. And the first part was near the very beginning where he was talking about Scranton, Pennsylvania, being a place where revival would take place uh, and the crossroads for revolution for the the United States, that it would be a key factor in the way America goes in the future. That was an interesting word. And uh, going on to talk about how do you have to learn how to encircle your portion and establish your portion, and I don't know what he means by that. And there are some people that may try to attempt to tell me what he means by that, but I don't know if you know what that means by that for, for people that are trying to explain that. Because it's vague. It is very vague to say those things. And it's this very confusing way that he is uh, putting together the sentences and and compounding the the thought that it it makes no sense. And then he's going on to to tell about that every time God speaks, something comes out of your blood that gives the Spirit more access to you. And you know where is that in scripture there was no scriptural reference to that and he talks about two dimensions working in us as to his disciples and that we have to advance in this season so that that kind of gives you an idea for those that may be familiar with this movement or maybe you're listening to this because you have loved ones that are involved in this movement and you're wanting to know what in the world are people hearing in this movement, well, this is one thing. I mean, Chuck Pierce is a very popular, very well-known man in this movement. He's recognized as an authority figure in this movement. Uh, he is recognized as a, as a prophet, even an apostle over his ministry. And he was affiliated with C. Peter Wagner, who appointed Chuck Pierce over areas. Um, I think he was even a spiritual offspring, if you will, of C. Peter Wagner, along with Cindy Jacobs and Shayon. So you have some of this going on that's being prophesied, but it's, it's, again, vague, convoluted, and very difficult to test. And then there's the component of it of Christian nationalism, if you will, that's being thrown into there. And several people that are high profile, Dutch Sheets, Chuck Pierce, Cindy Jacobs, others are prophesying that uh, a time of war, Cindy Jacobs, I uh, won't play any clips today, but I, I heard some of hers that she did, that she said, this is the era of war. And she's appealing, as Chuck Pierce does, to the Hebrew calendar, 5784. There's other people such as Chris Rosebro and, and others who have talked about this and tackled this from a biblical standpoint and, and re- rebutting this appeal to the Hebrew calendar in order for us to know and to recognize what's going on and appealing to the Jewish feasts in order for us to pay attention to, to the times and seasons and also putting America on the same plane, if you will, of Israel as God has a covenant with America. God does not have a covenant with America. The, the, I mean, it's putting it on the same level and then and we have the election coming up in 2024 in the United States for the presidency. And, of course, that's um, stirred a lot of these um, these prophetic words that people are claiming and saying that we need a wartime president and that if we don't, these people are claiming, such as Cindy Jacobs, that God is telling them that, that our enemies will think that we're weak, that they'll recognize that we're weak if we don't have a wartime president. There's all this focus just to, just to offer some insight or and just some thoughts. There's so much focus on man or woman. There's a lot of focus on human fallible human beings and and sinful human beings and and wanting someone to come in and sweep in and save the day so that we can be prosperous in the United States based on what we deem as prosperous or prosperity. Rather than telling people, you need to turn back to Christ, true prophets of God would tell people, go back to the Word of God 
and true revivals would be word centered. And I would argue that the what these people are saying, this is not from God. If you have to give a prophecy outside of Scripture and you want to say, thus saith the Lord, and put authority to it, but then deny that it has authority to it, that it can be fallible, and that you're just practicing hearing the voice of God, then you're not a prophet. You're a false prophet. If you if you prophesy something falsely, and if even if you prophesy something that's accurate, and you're leading people away from the God of the Bible, such as Deuteronomy 13 talks about, then you're not a true prophet of God. And the argument can be made today that we don't need true prophets today. I'm kind of getting my head of myself at the end of this, but we don't need modern day prophets today. We have the more sure word of prophecy. A scripture is referenced in 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. You can look that up. And we also have Jesus as the final prophet, Hebrews 1, 1. When we see that in the last days that God has spoken through his son, Jesus Christ, So we have a prophet, a priest, and a king that is established. It is Jesus Christ. His word is sufficient, it is complete, and there's no need. And we could stop right here with this episode, couldn't we? We could stop right here with this podcast and say this. Though I know that there will be people that disagree, and that's okay. Because we can have these discussions, and we should be able to have them respectfully. But we always go back to the authority of of Scripture, So I'm not obligated and you're not obligated when someone says, God told me this and it didn't come to pass. I'm not obligated to listen to that person and neither are you. And you're not obligated to to fear them. And we'll talk about this at the end. There's an article I found that I think will be helpful in this matter. And we're going to talk about some true prophecies that are found in scripture and what prophecy really does. Just to kind of, maybe this is going to give you another reminder or it's going to call to your remembrance once again. Oh yeah, it's the word of God. This is what I need to go back to because this is prophetic. It's apostolic. We have the apostles teaching us through the word of God. This is apostolic because they've been sent by the chief apostle, Jesus Christ, and they're teaching us. So there's no need for apostles and prophets today, as people like Catherine Crick will will try to prophesy and say that they're needed today, and that those who don't want to go along with this, that they're under an old wineskin and adopting these things that have been around for a long time, and what she's saying, she's not saying anything new, it's under the sun. So Chuck Pierce is one of them. We'll move on. I'd mentioned a few minutes ago about Troy Black. I wanted just to tell you a little bit about some of the things that Troy Black said in this prophetic word for 2024. And some people have covered him before. I've talked about him before. A lot of the words I've noticed he gives are um, vague. They're generalized. He'll say something is going to happen. Uh, there, It's a general word as far as for this year. He begins about a minute and 15 seconds in talking about the renewal of the saints and that uh, the Lord told him. And I recorded, I went back and listened again to how many times he said, the Holy Spirit said, the Lord said, God said, he said, when he's referencing and he's making an authoritative statement and saying, the Lord said, He says it 61 times in this video. I'm not kidding. I went back and listened to it, and I did little hash marks on a piece of paper. And Every time he said that, I I marked it down. 61 times in this video that he posted on his YouTube channel, he said, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Holy Spirit said, God said, he said, he told me. He told me right now to say this. He told me right now to stop right here. He's speaking with authority. But at the same time, As I've said before, and others have said, Troy, though he seems very gracious and very kind and sincere in what he's saying, and he will present scripture, I think in doing that, it can really veil the false prophecy that's given in those things. If you're not paying attention and you're seeing, oh, well, he's presenting scripture, he's talking about the gospel, but at the same time, he's claiming authority that he's getting new revelation from God. And he's pointing you back to those prophecies. Even though he's putting scripture in there, he points you back to his prophecies and his accuracy that he deems his accuracy. And in some of these, like I'm saying today, they're very vague and generalized. So how do you test those? Well, he's saying that you have to wait to see if they'll come to pass. But the problem is they're so vague in general, they could apply in several different ways. So it makes it difficult to truly test those things in accordance with scripture and this is one of the questions I would like to to respectfully ask him and others that talk like this. If you're going to say 
that God is speaking to you and God says these things and you say, the Lord says, but then you want to say, you know, this scripture goes along with this as you're, as you're declaring your prophetic word. Why do we need your prophetic word? And someone who came out of this movement, such as myself, looking at this, I wonder if they would garner as much an audience or traction if they went on YouTube and they said, I was reading the Bible and the the Lord just encouraged me with his word and this is what it says. Realizing that this is prophetic in nature. It is forthtelling. The gospel is prophetic. It is forthtelling. It is proclaiming Christ. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19.10. That scripture will be misapplied and misappropriated and twisted and abused to mean things that it doesn't mean in the prophetic movement. And I'm familiar with that verse as other people are. I'm not the only one that's familiar with this. Those that have been in this movement, we know full well some of the verses that are quoted in order to to validate this type of movement and to validate fallible prophecy. And that whenever you're prophesying, you're testifying of Jesus. But the question could be posed, how are these vague general words that aren't specific, and we'll see in Scripture today, that when God spoke through His prophets, they were specific. Even hundreds of years before Christ was born, before He was betrayed, their prophecies were specific. They were detailed. They had numbers applied to them at times, and they were accurate in their locations and such. But these today are very vague in general. They're convoluted. And I know I'm repeating myself, but I want you to just think about that and consider that. And as Troy Black goes on, he mentions the word element, that a precious element that he knew God was referring to the bride. And to stop, and he said, the Lord said to stop doubting that I'm watching over you. Again, why do we need that word when we can go to scripture to know that that God promises us that he will never leave us nor forsake us? In this movement, I believe if you had people that were simply coming on to a YouTube channel or writing a blog or whatever they're doing or writing books, and they did not appeal to what the Lord told me and said, well, this is scripture encouraged me in this way and in a difficult time because it says this, and it reminds me and it assures me that God will never leave me. There may be some of that going on in some of these videos, but at the same time, Again, the argument is there is an appeal to authority when you're claiming that you're hearing the voice of God for yourself, and then you're claiming to be a prophet. And then you're claiming that, you know, you can test these words and take them and and test them by the Holy Spirit, but then when you do test them, then you're told, well, you don't, you're not really hearing the Holy Spirit if you disagree with me. So there's, there's disingenuine behavior going on from some of these people when they don't want, they don't want to be tested. They don't want to be told that they're not hearing the voice of God on this matter or that their prophecy was false. He has had that happen before. But he goes on in this word, he says he over that God tells him he oversees the change happening in the church and that he's coming to get the church up until that time. He says, I'm changing her to look like me. Um, he believes, Troy believes that the renewal God is telling him about is dealing with the unity of the Spirit. Those who are walking by the Spirit will walk together despite their differences. And I would just, just as a side note, you know, there's going to be a call for unity by people in in these types of movements. And if you don't agree with them, then you're causing division. And I think that we need to be um, loving enough yet firm enough in the word to say it's false teachers and false prophets that bring division. And we are to mark and avoid those that would do such things and that would lead people away from the Word of God in its sufficiency and in the power of the gospel, and that would preach another gospel. We need to be firm in that, and that is loving. It is loving to tell people the truth when saying that. And the prophetic movement today, the modern prophetic movement, it leads people away from Christ. It leads people away from the truth of God's Word, and it leaves it to where God's Word is not sufficient. It's not a sufficient enough prophetic word. And now what's happened is the, the gospel becomes watered down and it becomes a stepping stone. So now it's, well, you just get saved. And some people may not feel this way, but there are people that that unknowingly view the gospel this way. Well, the gospel is a stepping stone or I graduate from it and I move on from it. 
And as I've said before, even personally, I will never get over what what Christ has done for me. I deserve judgment for the things that I did in assigning things that I said God told me when He did not say them, and I believed that He did. I believed that I was hearing the voice of God for myself. I believed I was getting revelation, extra biblical revelation outside of Scripture, and I was getting words for people and telling them these things, and I was getting these words to write in blogs and saying God said them, which is blasphemy to do such a thing, to assign things to to God that He never said, and showing my insufficiency for the Word of God. And so we've got to get back to the sufficiency of the Word of God and and understanding what His Word is and growing in our fellowship with God through understanding His Word and understanding Him in the process. Troy continues to go on. He says, if you can stay focused on the gospel, there's no telling what you can do in this next season. And he sees the vision of a catapult. And I, I just, again, I want to say, notice how he mingles scripture with, with his, the Lord is saying, because he will reference scripture in this. He references Philippians chapter two, verses three through five, when he's talking about the bride of Christ looking more like God, that, that God is doing this. He's changing the bride to look more like him. He references Colossians three near the end. And he will put in scripture there, but at the same time, he's mingling in these prophetic words and saying, the Lord is saying. So the question could be posed, are these viewed as on par in authority as scripture? And he may say no, but when has God ever spoken that in, and it would not be authoritative, that it not be something that is to be obeyed and to be listened to? And he keeps saying, I heard the Lord say, And the things that he said, again, are very vague and very generalized. It's also important to notice, not just with Troy, I'm not picking on him, but in general, when you hear people talk like this, and I used to talk like this, notice how when you hear people that say they hear the voice of God and that they they are a prophetic voice, they may not ever come out and say, oh, I'm a prophet, but the inference is there. I'm a prophetic voice. Notice how he and others that do this are speaking in the first person when claiming to hear directly from God. And and at one point, Troy in this video actually says, well, some are saying, well, this can't be true, as if he knows their thoughts. So these are things to pay attention to, because another fallible human being is not going to know the thoughts of another person like that. We don't see that modeled in the Word of God. The only person that knew the thoughts of another man was Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're going to play the card of, well, I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I can know another person's thoughts. I've heard Todd White say those things. I've heard Jennifer LeClaire and others make these statements. As a side note, I was in a service several years ago when I was actually ministering in a service. And I heard Jennifer LeClaire with my own ears in a breakout session. She was telling people that you have to be very careful about your emails and your texts because if you're going to be rebelling against a leader and you're going to be speaking against them, then that leader can know what's in your text messages and in your emails. And frankly, that type of talk and that type of rhetoric and that type of teaching is abusive and it's manipulative. And what it does is it causes people, in that example, trying to play the card of a prophet will know your thoughts and know your text messages and they can see your emails, and they're basing that on one descriptive verse referencing Elisha and a king, a pagan king, that was told by his servants that Elisha the prophet knew what he talked about in his personal chambers regarding the the strategies of battle and such, that's a manipulative play, and it's inappropriate to do such a thing, to to take a verse like that and to apply it that way. And I'm using as an example, this is relevant because it's talking about the prophetic. I'm just telling you these things so you can pay attention to them. And if you have loved ones that are doing this, then maybe you can ask them questions about this. Well, I know that you like listening to these prophets and you believe and, and you put great weight on what they're saying, but have you considered that they're taking certain passages out of context, that these are not prescriptive passages? We're not told that we can do those things. This is describing the time in the Old Testament with Elisha, and it's not even saying that Elisha heard that. The servant was simply telling the king that. We don't know that for certain. But these are some of the things that Troy Black was saying. And then as he went on, 
um, he talked about the political word at 18 minutes, 37 seconds. And I played some of that in the beginning where he saw the Christmas cookie and the cookie cutters or the molds, as he called them. And that um, God said, I'm molding something new this year. What is that something? You see, and then he's saying, well, there's something's going to happen around the middle of the year. It's going to be in January and July. Something's going to happen. And then it's going to be a, a bridge for the, the parties. So two things. You need to pay attention to what he's saying. It needs to be tested and judged. And there needs to also be a recognition that at the same time, there's some things he's saying that you can't test it completely because it's so vague. And he could assign and say, oh, yep, that, that came to pass because so-and-so said this and so-and-so did this. Then that came to pass, and I said, and something was going to happen in Idaho about a political thing. Oh, look at that. Something happened in Idaho. You know, so we have to just be diligent and pay attention to those things. Now, I did mention Patricia King a few minutes ago. I wanted to play a couple of clips from her. So she mentioned the first video, part one, was six different prophetic words. She said she meets with the Lord every year. She said this about six and a half minutes into that video. And the first word she gave was close to nine minutes, which she said she was meeting with Jesus in his heavenly chambers. Let's listen to what she had to say about that. Second Chronicles 20, 20, it says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And of course, Jesus is our prophet, but we connect into his heart because he's prophet, priest, and king. We connect into his heart, into his understanding, and then can move forward in that. So the first word I want to open up to you is um, exciting for you. And it's about meeting with Jesus in his heavenly council chambers. Okay, so I want to share about the vision, a number of visions I had connected to this revelation. So what I saw were many apostles and prophets gathering in spirit-appointed round tables. So if you are an apostle or prophet, don't be surprised if you get an invitation to attend a round table where other apostles and prophets are sitting around sharing what they are receiving from the Lord. So I saw all these round tables and they were in every nation. They were just all over the world. These round tables were popping up and uh, there were convocations all around the world in various groups, organizations. Um, and at various times, uh, there was this um, collective coming together to discern God's will, his purposes and his assignments and decrees for this hour and beyond. It was almost like everyone was discerning this new era that we're in and wanting to prepare for like the next decade. And some of those individuals had experienced what I call ascensions. That means where you're taken up, like Paul said, that he was taken up into the third heaven, right? So many of them had experienced as ascensions into the presence of the Lord privately before they got to these meetings where they had received divine instruction and insight, kind of like what we see in Matthew 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration. Patricia King goes on to say that these apostles and prophets had ascended to a round table with Jesus and that they were sitting at a table of counsel. And she says it's C-O-U-N-C-I-L. So they were counseling with Jesus, but they were a council. And as she's talking about this, this the ascension, she goes on to say in this vision that she saw that there were empty seats around the table where Jesus was holding counsel with a council, and they were given blueprints on scrolls and then given legislation power. Now, these empty seats, she encouraged people. She said, you know, maybe you feel like that this is God telling you that you're supposed to have one of those seats. She encourages them, pray into it and ask God and and basically making a statement that, you know, if this is something that you want, that God will grant that desire. You just have to pray into it and maybe you have a burden for that. At any rate, uh, these blueprints were given out on scrolls. And then she says these people were being mandated for the last days and only those who are passionate and serious will be able to enter. Does any of this sound familiar with these are there are always these stipulations that are placed by those that are saying that they hear from God outside of Scripture. So it, there's a there's a level of pietism that's assigned. And uh, I was reading a recently reading an article by Bob DeWay on the Critical Issues Commentary, and I added it to my resource page because it's really good. It's that how does pietism destroy Christians or Christianity? It's very damaging when you look at it. I was reading the article and could relate to quite a bit of it because of the uh, what happens in the charismatic movement with these types of beliefs and teachings that if you just do these certain things, she's talking about ascensions. I mean, ascensions, if I'm not mistaken, are things that are talked about in the New Age. So she's using the same terminology, and some people may push back and say, well, what's, what's wrong with that? 
Well, we're not to look like the world, and there's nowhere in Scripture that we're told that we can do these ascensions. This was not according to the will of man. This was according to the will of God. And even when Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians 12, he was reluctant to talk about it, and he did not describe what he saw in heaven, and he did not counsel with God, and there was not a round table that he sat at for Jesus to get his opinion on something or his intel on something. Jesus doesn't need our intel, and he doesn't need our counsel. So these are just things that she was talking about in this first vision, and I'm trying to make this one brief, and I apologize because just for time's sake, I want to really get to some of the articles I found that I think will be most helpful to you. And for you to to go back and say, okay, whether I know someone that believes these things hold water or hold weight, uh, spiritually speaking, or maybe I still hold on to those things, or I believe that these people are prophets— Uh, When you're instructed to go back in prayer and to see if the Holy Spirit agrees with this, you know, I've made this point before, you need to consider, first of all, Scripture is the final authority. If it agrees with Scripture, it's not necessary because we already have Scripture. And third of all, if who, who is the arbiter of truth here? If you're going back and you're telling someone, well, you just need to pray about it, like Troy Black does, you know, in all sincerity, he's trying to tell people, go back and test it and pray about it. But I have, personally, I have my doubts if they really want these things tested, because when people do test them and say, well, when I go to Scripture, it's not just about me praying about it and asking the Holy Spirit for myself what it means, because that's subjective. When I go back to Scripture, which is objective and is telling the truth and is the final authority for a born-again believer— then I'm finding that this is not agreeing with Scripture, and I reject it. And then when you say that, well, you're a Pharisee, and you're critical, and you don't have the Holy Spirit. I've had people tell me I don't have the Holy Spirit for testing these things. We can see some of this abuse going on that you're and manipulation that you're not allowed to test these things really uh, against Scripture. And there are people that will test them that are within the charismatic movement. So I want to be fair about that. They they were they're wanting to test them and to uphold Scripture. But we we always have to go back, again, to the final authority. So I want to be fair in saying that. At the same time, we have to really be cautious with someone, extremely cautious when someone is saying that they speak for God. A lot of error comes about when you say, God told me, or God said. As Patricia King goes on, she uh, at 22 minutes, she said the Holy Spirit was speaking to her, referencing Jeremiah 23, 18, about 24 and minutes and 50 seconds in, she talks about just as there will be a true move of God, there will be a counterfeit demonic council, which was her second vision. And she said, coming alongside leaders is in what sounds like the seven mountains of influence. And she said, there were blindfolded believers given scrolls by the demons to carry out demonic purposes in churches. Now, I'm a, I am I will say this. I have read books like Rick Joyner's The Final Quest, which I want to review that at some point and talk about it because Honestly, it's an awful book, and it's really making this divisive look of Christians, and it's putting Rick Joyner on a pedestal that he is esteemed in heaven, and all these people are bowing to him or or reverencing him in a way when he finally gets there to stand before the Lord, and he's recognized as a general and goes on with all these these visions and uh, pretty graphic stuff in the beginning with, with demons throwing up on the backs, they're on the backs of Christians and throwing up on them, and all these things happen, and creating the gray versus the blue Um, Christians as far as how they think, and those that don't agree with the move of God are the ones that are opposing the move of God, and they have the demons on their backs. It's really, it's like I said, it, it goes beyond Scripture. He's going beyond what is written, and that's what Paul instructed not to do to the Corinthian church. And furthermore, it's trying to add additional revelation that is not necessary, and we don't need it, and it doesn't agree with Scripture. Once again, I am going to be like a broken record today with that, but it's okay. So Patricia King's doing a similar thing. She's seeing these blindfolded believers, and she said also unbelievers are being used, but she originally said blindfolded believers are given scrolls by the demons to carry out demonic purposes. And just so you can hear this and verify it, I'm going to play it right now. Alongside, and the greater the influence, the stronger the demon. And what was disturbing to me was that along with the lesser demons and corrupt individuals, because there was real corrupt individuals who did not know the Lord. But I also sadly saw some believers in the demonic council chamber room this time. 
I thought, what are believers doing in there? But they were blindfolded and they were given scrolls carrying demonic assignments that they were to carry out. And the blindfolds in this encounter spoke to me of the deceitfulness of sin that blinds believers to the enemy's strategies and attacks. So these individuals were being controlled and influenced by the enemy and then sent back into the church and different realms of influence in the earth to carry out demonic purposes. And most of them were not even aware that they were being controlled or that they were being held captive. And uh, they were not even struggling to come free. They just thought they were right in their own mind. Now, some of the things that she said, people are going to say, well, she's correct. I mean, that's that's an accurate prophetic word as far as um, the the evil or the the sin or demonic influence of uh, authoritative leaders that have high in levels of influence in the world. But that's nothing new. I mean, we can see this. This has been going on for quite some time. This is kind of reading the room, if you will. But then she goes on to say what she just said about the blindfolded Christians. Now, we know that Scripture warns about from the apostles' teachings, from their writings that were inspired by the Holy Spirit to not operate in the, the sins of the flesh or the works of the flesh, but to be led by the Spirit. It doesn't say about being led by demons. It does say that people will listen to doctrines of demons from false teachers and such like that. So, I found that kind of ironic uh, to be saying something like that and that the blindfolded Christians were actually counseling with demons. I, I'm, I would just say, in a loving yet firm way, listening to teachings like this, I believe, is leading people into error, uh, believing that these are, are prophetic words when we need to be going back to the Word of God, the more sure word of prophecy to know what it says in the right context. So there can be times that you hear people that are saying these things, that, it, that there's elements of truth into it. There's little bits of truth. But then you have poison mixed in with it. There's a little bit of cyanide in the water is still deadly. If, if you've heard this analogy, that it mixes in with water and it's not there. It's not even evident to the, to the naked eye. Well, the same thing with these types of prophetic words, when you have things that are being said and people are standing in a place of authority, such as Patricia King and others that stand in a place of authority and they're saying, I'm hearing for the Lord for this coming era, for this next decade. And they're saying these things. And I've been in the room when she was saying these things about, not necessarily this, but when she was talking about this next era in 2019, I was in a small room with a group. I was invited as a recognized prophet. And that was the last meeting uh, conference that I attended. That was kind of like the nail in the coffin for me. And I had already been questioning things and trying to work through things based on scripture. And I went and I was invited and knowing that I had major questions in, in my mind and in, in going back to the Word. And when I left at the end of that, that pretty much was the nail in the coffin for me of going, yeah, I, I, I no longer can be affiliated with any of these things. So you have that, and then she continues to go on about 36 minutes in. She gives a word for the United States. Uh, she talks about um, equipping the anointing in 38 minutes I want to go back to the word for the USA in just a moment, but she goes on to say the Lord is calling his people to be skilled and focused on him and not on the devil. Uh, the ministry of the watchman is highlighted, and we've heard some others such as Jennifer LeClaire, and, and you'll hear Chuck Pierce when he talks at times, if you listen to some of his, that he focuses on the watchman. Uh, she said there's an increased focus on training and doing deliverance ministry, and this will swell over the next five years. Well, God willing, I hope that doesn't happen because the deliverance ministry is doing, it's not even a ministry, it's really doing a lot of damage uh, to people and not even realizing the the error that it, it is operating in, in the teaching. And this goes back for long periods of times, even from the beginning where Derek Prince and others during that time frame when it began to come at its peak and uh, Kenneth Hagen and others would teach on deliverance ministry and doing battle with, with demons. Uh, about 45 minutes in, she talks about the eighth mountain that's coming up. She, she believes in the seven mountain mandate. She says the eighth mountain is going to be the focus, which is the mountain of the Lord, and she provides scripture for that. And then about 46 minutes in, she talks about the loss of lands, but the increase for others. So there's always this uh, undertone of a transfer of wealth, if you will, and that there's going to be loss, but there's going to be increase for those that are faithful. But I want to go back real quick, and then we're going to go into some articles to look at 
to get some better understanding as far as Scripture is, to appreciate what Scripture says about true prophecy. 36 minutes in, here's the word that she gave for the United States of America. I did get a specific word about the USA as a nation. The USA, um, I saw in that council uh, of, of demons, the USA has a specific target on it. Other nations did too, but I just didn't hear them. But I could see the map of the world and there was certain places being highlighted, but I know the USA is being targeted. And so although the enemy strategies will attempt to target every nation, I received a specific word for the USA, the USA has been a superpower in previous decades, but it's being targeted by the enemy to be overthrown and brought down. And this will be devastating on many levels, unless, did you hear that? Unless there is repentance from pride, lawlessness, and corruption. The enemy has demanded his legal right to control this nation and its people due to the great compromise in the church. So again, it goes back to focusing on the United States, and um, she doesn't say this, but you'll hear some of these leaders make reference to the United States, almost equating it with Israel in a way, and that God has made a covenant with America, and we don't have any indicator of that. And Scripture is not telling us uh, any of these things, and she's she's basing this on her own intel that she's getting from a vision she saw in this council. So we're having to believe what she says, and and we can go back to this argument of when you claim that God is showing you these things and God is making you privy to this information, then we need to obey what you're saying and we need to believe it because you're speaking from a place of authority. You're claiming that you saw this vision and putting yourself on par with the apostles like Paul and John that saw things for the church, that saw things in the spirit, and they were given limitations of what they could say. And at the same time, what they stated was clear. It was not ambiguous. It was not, when, as far as when they talked about it in detail. Now, we know Paul did not in 2 Corinthians 12, but in the book of Revelation, for example, if we want to focus on that being prophecy and, and believing that uh, ongoing prophecy is for today as far as extra biblical revelation that carries authoritative weight according to God's word and his decree, then we need to look at Revelation and see the great amount of detail and specificity that's within the book of Revelation, let alone the other areas of Scripture that we'll, we'll talk about in just a minute. She's speaking from a place of authority because of this vision. And so the, the question is, are you going to believe what she's saying? Because she's saying that she has the words for the next era, the next decade for the church. And now she's saying that it's all based, and again, this is, this is nothing new that's being stated, but this whole plan of destroying America will be changed if, if people, if the church will begin to pray because it's the church that has allowed these things to infiltrate. Now, if you want to look at things on a societal level, and we could go into a, a whole different area of, of talking about this, if you want to look at if the church has been complacent and lackadaisical in areas of culture and dealing with the family and dealing with the sanctity of marriage and life and things, then yes, we can have that discussion. And certainly that is fair to say that. But once again, she's not saying anything new. This is not prophetic. You can read the room or read, read the newspapers and read the world as far as what's going on and see the divisiveness that's going on, to see the tension that's going on, to see that, yes, the church has been silent at times and even and complicit and, and not being more proactive in stating uh, the, the sanctity of marriage and the, the value of human life and children's and a, and a child's life within the womb and things like that. Certainly, we can talk about that. But this topic today is talking about is this prophetic? Is this a true prophetic word from God? And I would tell you that you don't need to listen to people like her that are cl claiming this authority. And furthermore, she's using language and she's, she's using these concepts that are based in the New Apostolic Reformation. 
And it's a, that's a dangerous movement. So I would say, no, you don't need to listen to these people. They need to get back to Scripture in the right context. I mean, she was even referencing at one point Psalm 2 and about how God laughs, and He does. But then she was applying it to us and saying, all we need to do is laugh. And Kenneth Hagin did the same thing. He encouraged people if, to laugh at the devil and, and to act in such a way. But that's God that's laughing at the nations because He is sovereign. And then you see, well, the devil is able to do this and come in but only if we pray and we do something. So where is the sovereignty of God in all of this? Where is God in all of this that, you, that you're going to make Satan sovereign now and that he's going to have this control, but it's really about us taking control back and that's how this will stop. But it places God on the periphery of all of this, which we know is not the God of the Bible. God is sovereign. He is, he is the center of it all. Jesus Christ is the object of our faith. He is central. He is the central figure in Scripture. He is the one that the Bible is about. And the people that God speaks about in, in the Bible are being used by God in certain ways for His glory, but it's all Christ-centered. It is not man-centered. Now, I want to get to a couple of these articles with you today, and um, I may have a couple other links for you to check out, but I found these quite helpful as I was doing some research to talk about this and the angle to talk about this today. I actually have four different links I'm going to share with you today, but I'm only going to go through uh, two, maybe two and a half of these articles with you, but I encourage you to look at them and read them on your own time. There's a website called Reasons to Believe, and I found this article that was written in 2003 by Hugh Ross titled Fulfilled Prophecy, Evidence for the Reliability of the Bible. And they go through and actually present some statistical data to show, based on some examples from Scripture, of the different prophecies that were given. So, again, I'm going to provide the link in the description below. I highly encourage you. I, I try to do this in these episodes to, to divert you or to refer you back to a reputable source that will help you or a reference. I'm providing commentary and based on what Scripture says, but I want you to go to Bible scholars and go to these references and Ultimately, obviously, your final authority is Scripture. But these are going to help you in your Bible study, and I believe these are going to help you give a true perspective of what true prophecy looks like in accordance with Scripture. Reasons to believe mention some of the prophecies found in the Old Testament, for example. So, number one, they say sometime before 500 B.C., the prophet Daniel proclaimed that Israel's long-awaited Messiah would begin his public ministry 483 years after the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. This is in Daniel chapter 9. Nine, verses 25 and 26. He further predicted that the Messiah would be cut off, killed, and that this event would take place prior to a second destruction of Jerusalem. Abundant documentation shows that these prophecies were perfectly fulfilled in the life and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The decree regarding the restoration of Jerusalem was issued by Persia's king Artaxerxes to the Hebrew priest Ezra in 458 B.C., 483 years later, the ministry of Jesus Christ began in Galilee. In parentheses, they state, remember that due to calendar changes, the date for the start of Christ's ministry is set by most historians at around A.D. 26. Also note that from 1 B.C. to A.D. 1 is just one year. Jesus' crucifixion occurred only a few years later, and about four decades later in AD 70 came the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus. They note that the probability of the chance of this being fulfilled is one in 10 to the fifth power. And so they have 13 prophecies listed. Uh, for the last one I'll go to, they talk about uh, one prophet of God unnamed is number 13, but probably Shemaiah said that a future king of Judah named Josiah would take the bones of all the occultic priests, priests of the high places of Israel's king Jeroboam, and burn them on Jeroboam's altar. This was found in 1 Kings 13, 2 and 2 Kings 23, 15 through 18. This event occurred approximately 300 years after it was foretold. The probability of the chance of fulfillment is 1 in 10 to the 13th power. So this is a really interesting article. I would just, again, encourage you to look at it 
and to appreciate what what they're saying what they're saying as far as the statistics are concerned. Now, there's another article I'll reference to you. It's from BibleStudyTools.com, and it's a long article that talks about the Old Testament is filled with fulfilled prophecy. And so they note about the prophecies of Babylon, of Nineveh, Tyre, and Edom, uh, the, the prophecy that Babylon will rule over Judah for 70 years, that that was specific and it was fulfilled, The Babylon that Babylon's gates will open for Cyrus. That was noted in um, Isaiah 45, 1. Uh, Babylon's kingdom will be permanently overthrown, Isaiah 13, 19, that that was fulfilled. And they, they say several of these were fulfilled as far as this was concerned, that Nineveh will be destroyed by fire. This was found in Nahum chapter 3, verse 15, and that was written around 614 B.C., uh, we continue to go on through this. There's so many that they list in the Old Testament. But then they say that the greatest Old Testament prophecy of all, and we're talking about our glorious Lord and Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. They note in this article, there are literally hundreds of other fulfilled prophecies that we could describe here, but clearly one stand ahead one stand a head and shoulders above the rest, and we really need to take a minute to describe it. While the Jews were certainly comforted by prophecies that predicted that their enemies would eventually be destroyed, there was a far more comforting prophecy that had been described in the Old Testament. It was a prophecy that predicted the coming of a Messiah, a Savior who would deliver the Jews. While there are dozens of messianic prophecies in the Old Testament scriptures, one of these was incredibly specific in its claims. As we examine this prophecy, we can confirm the supernatural and divine inspiration of the Bible. And they go on again to point out Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. They're agreeing with the, the previous article in Reasons to Believe that we just noted. And they go on to talk about the history of this. And they make this point in their article, what does fulfilled prophecy prove? Well, it proves the ancient Jews were careful to use prophecy as a measuring stick. If someone claimed to be a prophet, yet his predictions did not come true, he was abandoned and his writings did not make it into the canon of scripture. Moses was careful to set this high bar for prophets. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing followed not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Moses knew that fulfilled prophecy was an evidence. It was an evidence that God was truly at work in the heart of the prophet, giving him insight to something that only God knew about. The exact fulfillment of all the prophecies that we've talked about from the Old Testament is more than enough to demonstrate the accuracy and divine inspiration of the Bible and the truth of Christianity. Remember, only God can declare the end from the beginning and forecast to the very day things that are not yet done. Isaiah 4610. This again, this is a really good article that I would uh, reference. And you can find even online, I think I talked about this last year, the hundreds of prophecies that Christ fulfilled that are found within the Old Testament and going into the New Testament. And so we can appreciate the uh, the in- inerrancy and the infallibility and the specificity and the accuracy of Scripture and those who were who were indeed prophets that spoke on behalf of God and did not just give vague generalities or read the room in order to see what was going on. Some of these prophets in the Old Testament spoke hundreds of years before what they said would come to pass. And they did not speak in such dark ways that you couldn't test what they were saying. And that it, it, we do find that they were so specific in what they stated because God is not an ambiguous speaker. <laughs> and He's not speaking in such ways that it could be anything, that, it, that any, anything happening could fulfill that prophecy. Prophecy is specific. When God speaks, it is specific. And not only that, it is authoritative. And I used to agree with some of these belief systems. There's another article I'll reference real fast uh, from Reformation21.org. And this was from uh, March of 2012. But this was a, a, a summary, it looks like, from Nathan Busnitz that offered a critique, a thoughtful critique of Wayne Grudem's position on the perpetuity of the gift of prophecy. And so I'll leave the link for that below. I think that that will be most helpful. But the last article I want to reference here is from blueletterbible.org. And this was an article from Don Stewart. It says, in what sense does predictive prophecy show that the God of the Bible exists? And he goes through some different points to consider that the biblical test of 
of a prophet was 100% accuracy 100% of the time. No matter what anybody tells you, a true prophet of God in Scripture was 100% accurate. There is no prophet in, of God in the Bible that had fallible prophecy. No matter how much people want to argue for Agabus, it's not true in the New Testament. And we're in a better covenant, right? This is the argument. We're in a better covenant. So we're supposed to have all these better promises, which we do. But those are twisted sometimes in this movement. But when we're talking about prophecy, the more sure word of prophecy we have before us, the word of God, but we, above all, we have Jesus Christ, who is our final prophet. He is the, indeed, a Patricia, Patricia King is right. He is our prophet, priest, and king. And so we, we don't need these people to give us continuing revelation. So what constitutes fulfilled prophecy according to this article? For predictive prophecy to be considered valid, it must pass a number of tests. According to Don Stewart, they include the following. Number one, the prophecy must be given before the fulfillment takes place. He says this is primary. For any prophecy to be considered valid, it must be delivered before the events take place, not after the fact. Otherwise, we are not dealing with prophecy. And also, it would, it's, it's important to note, too, when you hear people that say their prophetic voices or speak on behalf of God and that God told them, and they're saying things that you can find in newspapers currently— That's not prophecy. Number two, the prophecy must be explicit. He says it cannot be so general and vague that it can mean anything and everything. It must say something specific. So some of the examples you've heard today, and there's, again, there are many. I mean, you go on now and it's just, it's it's a free-for-all in 20, for 2024. And it's, it happens every year. And then people give uh, words for different months, the month of May, the month of June. I never did stuff like that. I still did stuff that was egregious and and uh, blasphemous as far as speaking and saying God told me certain things and relying on dreams and visions. And by the way, Scripture also talks about that too. Even in Colossians 3, it makes a note of referencing people that are going on and on about their visions and their dreams and angelic and angels and such. And we're not to, Paul said, we're not to listen to those people. Um, we're to go back to the scripture that if people are not d- diverting you back to the authority of the word of God above everything, and they're not appealing to God told me and then putting their their visions and their dreams and their God told them alongside scripture, those, those are things we need to consider. Number three, the prophecy must be able to be falsified. And he says, the prophecy must be of such a nature that it can be proven to be false. It has to contain elements that can be either proven to be true or false. Unless a prophecy can be falsified, it is meaningless. So that may sound confusing when you read that, but essentially what this is saying is that you have to be able to prove that this is indeed false, meaning there have to be facts there. There has to be evidence there. If If someone is claiming to be a prophet and they've spoken, there has to be evidence there that can refute and rebut what they're saying. It can't, again, it cannot be this, this, these uh, vain imaginations that are so vague and so ambiguous that you cannot test them. That's not prophecy. And then again, unfortunately, that's in the ways I used to talk as well. And that's why I say things now against this, because th- this is not true prophetic ministry. And, and it shows that we don't have a, a sufficient love for God's word and a sufficient um, understanding of God's word, and that we're wanting to understand God's word, that we're that we're content in what God has left us. Number four, the prophet cannot have any part in the fulfillment. Um, he says another essential ingredient is that those who gave the prophecies, the biblical prophets, cannot have any part in the fulfillment. The prediction must be completely fulfilled apart from the one giving it. The prophet can have absolutely nothing to do with its coming to pass. Number five, the fulfillment must correspond exactly to the prediction. Don Stewart says, in addition for a prophecy to be considered valid, the fulfillment must correspond exactly and in all points to the predictions that were given. Partial fulfillment is not enough. Fulfillment must be exact. From here in this article, Don Stewart provides some examples of fulfilled Bible prophecy, and these are focusing on the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. So number one that he references in this article, the birthplace of the Messiah. He must be born in Bethlehem. This was referenced in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and we know this was fulfilled. Number two, the family line. He must be a descendant of David. The Old Testament predicted the exact family line that the Messiah would come through. This includes the line of Abraham referenced in Genesis chapter 20. 
22, verse 18, the line of Isaac, Genesis chapter 21, verse 12, the line of Jacob, Numbers 24, 17, the family line of Jesse, Isaiah 11, 1, and the line of David, Jeremiah 23, 5. This makes his ancestry clear. Number three that he references, he must come before Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. We see this in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. It's the third article I found that is referencing this Bible passage is about the 62 sevens, and the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. And he says, the temple and the city of Jerusalem were both destroyed in AD 70. Thus, the predicted Messiah was prophesied to come upon the scene of history before AD 70. He notes the prophecies were literally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we can see this, for example, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is noted in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This happened exactly how it was said that it was going to happen in Micah chapter 5. Jesus was a descendant of David. We see this referenced in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, where we read through the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Number three, Jesus came before the city and temple were destroyed. We can see that um, true to the prophecy, Jesus came on the scene of history before the city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. They were destroyed in AD 70. This was about 40 years after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. The odds that one person could fulfill these prophecies by chance are astronomical, but Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled these and many others demonstrating he was the promised Messiah. The Bible also gives us many prophecies concerning nations and individuals which have literally been fulfilled. These also demonstrate that God exists and that He is controlling history. He is controlling history, which means He is sovereign, and we need to remember that. So why has God told us the future, Don Stewart mentions in this article? He says, since the Bible gives us examples of God predicting the future, we may rightly ask the question, why has he done this? Why has God at times predicted future events? Through the prophet Isaiah, God gives us the answer to this question. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10 state this, And do not forget the things I have done throughout history, for I am God. I alone, I am God, and there is no one else like me. Only I can tell you what is going to happen, even before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. And that's the New Living Translation, and that's just in the article. I'm reading that as far as what's referenced in the article. That's not a personal preference. He also cites Isaiah 48, verses 3 through 5. Again, he uses the NLT, and this verse says, Time and again, I warned you about what was going to happen in the future. Then suddenly I took action. And all my predictions came true. I know how stubborn and obstinate you are. Your necks are as unbending as iron. You are as hard-headed as bronze. That is why I told you ahead of time what I was going to do. That way you could never say, my idols did it, my wooden image and metal god commanded it to happen. Don Stewart states from these verses, we can deduce the following. Number one, we can know that the God of the Bible exists. Number two, we can be assured that he is the only God who exists. Number three, we can be confident about his other predictions. Number four, we can trust everything God says, which I would say that in the modern prophetic movement, it creates distrust that God is speaking when you say that prophecy can be fallible. Number five, we can be confident God is controlling history. Again, goes back to his sovereignty. So I would encourage you to look at these articles on your own time and in your own Bible study if you're wanting to continue to look at spiritual gifts and in uh, in particular the prophetic and, and how that looks today compared to what Scripture has to say. Look at what Bible scholars are saying about it and test everything in accordance with Scripture and the proper understanding. And there's a lot of things that we need to understand about Scripture, the author, the historical context of what's going on. So, as always, I hope that this was a helpful episode today. My goal in doing these episodes, and in particular when I'm addressing the prophetic, as someone who was involved in this type of thing, and I was a small fish in a big pond, and I was not giving some of the bigger words, if you will, that that some of these people are with their bigger platforms. But I do feel a sense of responsibility and burden to say something having come out of this type of belief system and this movement, because this is new apostolic reformation that you're seeing in all of this that's that's being done. And when they're talking about the seven mountains and they're talking about taking over and uh, the different prophetic words and people saying they're prophets and that we need to listen to them. You know, Patricia King referenced Second Chronicles 2020 that I played, that y- if you'll believe the prophets that your way will prosper. I'm paraphrasing that, but that's one that's used quite often. I know it was used in 2020 for, for the prophets, but the point is we have to be willing to go back 
to what Scripture says in the proper context. And we need to be asking the questions, are these words today necessary? Are these people truly leading people back to Jesus Christ, or are they leading them unto themselves? Are these truly words from God, or are they vain imaginations? Are they myths? Are these people leading people astray? Are they saying things that are agreeing with Scripture completely, or are they mixing in truth with error? These are some of the things that have to be considered in these matters. And when you hear people that are making these vague generalizations, these are not prophetic words. I mean, we can encourage people, but to say that those are prophetic, and as I said, these are things that I used to do. There were a couple of things that I did that were more specific through the years, but a lot of the times it was these these recycled, vague, generalized words, and this is... This is happening continuously. And then not only that, people are speaking in such vagaries and ambiguity to where it's so broad, it could be fulfilled through anybody. And then you could claim, oh, that was from God. Or they're reading the room, if you will, uh, metaphorically speaking, and, and observing what's going on around them currently in culture and in other countries and globally, and basically making these statements that all the demons are going to put laws into place and such. Well, anybody could make that claim right now, and that's not prophetic. That That's just the state of the, the world right now with what's going on. But we need to go back to Scripture. Scripture is the more sure word of prophecy. We can understand that God is most certainly um, he exists, that his word is true, that it is not full of error, um, it is not full of ambiguity. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of prophecies that have been fulfilled throughout Scripture, both concerning Jesus Christ and other individuals as well, of things that would happen. They were specific, they were clear, they were detailed, they were explicit. We need to be asking questions. If If you're a person that continues to rely on these people, you need to ask yourself why. And do you know what Scripture says in context? Have you taken time to look at the prophetic words and to appreciate that the prophecies fulfilled about Christ are glorious and they're pointing back to Him? Have you considered that? Have you considered that someone is telling you that you are essentially the arbiter of truth when they tell you, go and pray and ask the Holy Spirit if what this person is saying is from God? Then you become the one that is deciding what is truth and what is error. And what happens to those people that say, you know, I prayed through this. This does not agree with what God would say. How are those people handled and viewed? You see, we have standards, and those standards are found in God's Word. And that's how we know what truth is and what error is. And I would encourage you to stick to the Word of God. You know that that is God speaking. Whenever you read the Bible, you know that is God speaking. And that's sufficient. That's what you need. So, I hope that this uh, episode is helpful to you as always, and please check out the links that are provided in the description until our time again next time when we look at another topic. Be blessed today by the truth of God's Word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.